So what I'd like to say is, by way of introduction, is that uh, I'm Rick Hansen, and I want to focus tonight on why and how to meditate. And in the process of that, I will um, probably speak to some of the questions uh, or other issues that came up during the meditation. And um, this is a deep topic, a fun one, and I'm looking forward to it. So here we go, and I'll try to reserve time for some questions. I'll see your comments and questions, um, you know, in the chat sidebar. And also, if we have time, uh, I'll talk with one or two of you. Also, I'm kind of thinking I'm going to cover a lot of very fundamental material, and uh, it could well be that uh, we'll ha have uh, questions and comments about it kind of all together next week in, in case there's not much time for that tonight. Okay. So here we go. Why do we meditate? And uh, why do we meditate? And is there a right way to meditate or a wrong way to meditate? And is there true meditation and false meditation? Uh, why do we meditate? And given the why, how to do it? So as the larger context, one why we meditate has to do with the greater good. Uh, it's, you know, Always important, of course, to intervene both in the world around us and inside ourselves. It's not either or. Uh, certainly, as we meditate in part for the sake of others, to help promote a calmer world, uh, to help people see clearly, to help people feel the internal stability that enables them to be strong. In the face of injustice, I mean, we to be able to, you know, see the good in others, even if we disagree with them. You know, we can meditate for the sake of the of the greater good, while also knowing that it's important to take very concrete action in society, whether it's putting a stop sign um, in a busy street outside of a school, or you know, being helpful with a neighbor, or doing what we can, um, you know. In the cause of uh, uh, just equal justice for all in the in the law enforcement system, uh, whatever it is we're doing, you know, we're, we can intervene in both those worlds. But certainly, in in the larger sense, we can meditate for the sake of others. Uh, I can say in in my own family that one of the things that helps me recover more rapidly from getting cranky with my my wife or our kids uh, is my own, you know years of background in meditation. So we meditate for them, not just for ourselves. That's kind of an overarching framework. And then inside of that, I want to just offer my own view about some different uh, whys to meditate and practices that can follow. And I'm going to sort these into, I think, five major groups. So the first why to meditate is to relax, to get off the stress hamster wheel, to chill out, to let the debris kind of settle, to disengage from the craziness. It's a very basic fundamental purpose for meditating and one that I think is completely credible and honorable. You know, you plop on the couch or whatever. Uh, you, maybe you have a cup of tea, you let your mind wander, you kind of come back, maybe half of you is sort of listening to a guided meditation. Maybe you're putting on some kind of new agey music. Uh, you know, maybe you're being aware of your body from time to time, but otherwise your mind's kind of wandering a little. But overall, you're settling, you're calming, you're coming home to yourself. It feels good. You're letting go of stress. You're letting go of tension. And when you get up, you feel better. Entry-level meditation. And I want to call that out and honor it and say, yeah, I've clocked a lot of minutes and hours uh, in that basic form of meditation. And the why of it is pretty clear, as I've named it. So if you're going to meditate in that way, the how, you know, know that you're meditating. Make it, make it special. Make it distinct. Uh, make it sacred in the sense of carving out a sanctuary for it so that you know that you're doing it. Uh, maybe let other people know that you're doing it. Maybe have a regular time every day. Maybe have a kind of general sense of a duration uh, for when you're going to meditate in this, in this fundamental 
basic uh, stress relief kind of way. Those are things that will help you help you do it. Uh, it can help to uh, have a certain routine. It can help to have a certain place where you go. Um, you know, can you can bring in a certain goodwill for yourself. These are basic hows of meditating in that fundamental, simple way. Okay, so show of hands. How many of you have ever meditated in what I'm calling an entry-level kind of way? So few hands. Okay, good. I was feeling really alone. I was feeling really embarrassed. I thought, okay, all right. And I don't know about you. For me, it's kind of a relief to feel like, okay, that counts. That counts. We can build from there, but it counts. It's okay. It's certainly better than the alternative, you know, stressed out of your gourd or chilling out on the sofa for at least a few minutes a day, dropped into the green zone, at least for that time, you know, that can be pretty good. Okay? All right. So second major why. Oh, oh, okay. It got your hands raised or thumbs up or I don't know, all those hands. I don't know what to do about them. So I'm going to ignore them for the moment. Anyway. Uh, okay, good. Uh, the thumbs up is different from a raised hand. You know, it has a different effect in Zoom. All right, second major purpose. That's the, this is the purpose I explored with you tonight, steadying the mind, steadying the mind. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, there are these three major pillars of practice. Uh, they're just called that, um, you know, sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila being morality, uh, virtues, uh, a focus on the greater good, cleaning up your own side of the street, also, samadhi, concentration, great steadiness of mind, including in deep absorptions into non-ordinary states of consciousness, and then wisdom, insight along the way. Now, all three of these work together. Uh, wisdom can motivate us to uh, operate in moral and, and non-harmful ways with others or in increase that. And in the process, let's say, of operating with others, in ways that restrain problematic, you know, behaviors of our own, sometimes we acquire some wisdom so they can fit together. In much the same way, uh, wisdom helps us be more concentrated and concentration fosters wisdom. That said, there is kind of a loose progression through these three that we, you know, establish a basic foundation of non-harming of ourselves and others. And then we move into forms of mental training, including through meditation, and as we do that more and more, a wisdom, including wisdom of the heart, gradually gathers and accumulates. There's a kind of a movement over time. Um, so that's a way of talking about the importance of steadiness of mind for all three of those uh, very important aspects of practice. It takes steadiness of mind to regulate ourselves, to regulate our biases, to regulate our amygdala hijacks, to regulate our behavior in different ways. You know, we need steadiness of mind for, you know, morality and virtue, and we need steadiness of mind to uh, discern what's actually happening in the processes of consciousness so that we can uh, develop growing, liberating insight. Being able to plop your attention on what matters to you and what you want to remain in touch with is a fundamental precondition really for just about any kind of deliberate learning or growing or healing or coping. And the other side of that coin is being able to at will disengage your attention and your investments in what's not helpful, what's harmful, what's problematic, what creates suffering for you and for other people. Fundamental process, if attention is like a combination spotlight and vacuum cleaner, it's illuminating what it rests upon while through processes of neuroplastic change, gradually sucking that into you with a bias based on how the brain has evolved toward internalizing negative experiences of anxiety, irritation, woundedness, hurt, addiction, and depression, and so on. So it's really important to get regulatory control over that spotlight and vacuum cleaner. And we can do that in in part through the second why, second major kind of why we meditate of deepening in concentration. 
Now, the process of deepening and concentration can begin with, uh, you know, the fundamental kind of foundation of, uh, you know, control of attention. And over time, and this is the path laid out by the Buddha, certainly, we can deepen in our concentration by moving through the wise or right mindfulness element of the Eightfold Path, uh, moving through, for example, mindfulness of breathing. There's a particular teaching from the Buddha that moves through different stages of increasingly um, stable and absorbed concentration and attention. We can also progress in our training of steadiness of mind through the right concentration or wise concentration element of the Eightfold Path that includes what are called the jhanas, the four non-ordinary states of consciousness that were well known in the Buddha's time. And he trained in and he, um, in effect, told us to train in so that we would increasingly develop great steadiness of mind while purifying consciousness. Because as we move through these jhana states, the hindrances, the things that obstruct us and cloud us tend to increasingly get purified out. We become increasingly motivated to practice as we experience these you know, states of consciousness that are clearly, you are no longer in Kansas when you're experiencing them. And I can say that from some experience, um, that be, they become more motivated. We become more motivated to practice. And as, our, as we deepen in these, in these unusual, powerful, profound, beautiful, luscious states of consciousness, we become increasingly able to observe our own minds. So there's a progressive process of deepening concentration that is aided by getting uh, you know, more control over attention, steadying and quieting and stabilizing moment-to-moment -moment presence of awareness. And as we, you know, drop increasingly into these non-ordinary states of consciousness and the jhanas or related sorts of samadhis or breakthrough experiences, that feeds back into our attention and we get steadier and steadier. This is a second major why. There's a lot of teaching about concentration practices and different methods in both the Buddhist tradition and in other traditions. Uh, in particular, for people who are interested in pursuing jhana practice, I'm not a teacher of the jhanas. I've experienced some of them myself, but I don't pretend to be able to teach them. That's where I turn to people like Shaila Catherine, Tina Rasmussen, Stephen Snyder, Lee Brasington, uh, Richard Shankman, and others who have really developed that in that path, which is a traditional path of training. Uh, I commend it to you. I really commend it to you. My own practice really took off when I started focusing more on steadiness of mind and concentration. In terms of everyday meditation, there are a number of factors that help to stabilize presence of mind. Many of which of these factors are informed by our growing understanding of our neurobiology as uh, grounded in our evolution as primates. So as a quick review, some of the multiple factors that support steadiness of mind that you can explore on your own are to establish a posture that is comfortable and alert, that's upright and dignified. Not uptight, not stiff, not pretentious, but in your own skin, claiming your place. That supports steadiness of mind. Another, establishing intention. Whether it's top-down, giving yourself the instruction, committing to a particular motivation for the 35 minutes, say, of a meditation, like tonight, or um, giving yourself over to a way of being, feeling already stable, already steady. That's a way to establish intention. Intention really matters to, you know, to prioritize steadiness of mind in your meditative practice or in general. That will foster it. 
Now, certainly, as with any factor, and I'll mention a few more in a moment, it may be hard to get it going at first. And then it could be frustrating, and then we have a kind of a choice. Do we keep trying to get it going, or for now, do we just let it go? Either one can be a good choice. Uh, sometimes you just let it go. Not happening, getting in the way. The effort to get it going is getting in the way of the result of what you're getting it going for. Psh, let it go. Really okay. On the other hand, as the Buddha laid out, and certainly makes sense to me, and I observe in all the traditions around the world, there's a place for cultivation. There's a place for development and training and saying, you know, it's not in reach yet. I can't experience it yet, but I want to start trying to experience it. And then as I experience whatever this might be, I'm going to increasingly take it into myself. You know, I'm reminded, as you may have heard me say, from the quotation from, I believe, Milarepa, great Tibetan sage, who said, describing his own life of practice, in the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. In the end, nothing left. So we're working with that. You know, we're trying to deal with the frustration as we cultivate various factors of nothing coming. Then in the middle, we're trying to help these stabilize, but they don't stay. You know, we can experience them as states, but they're not yet grown as traits. And then in the third stage, increasingly, the states we have experienced and then internalized, received into ourselves again and again and again through positive neuroplasticity, through the humility of receptivity, ah, increasingly those ways of being are native to us. We feel at home in them. and They have come to, come to live with us. All right, so that's a general statement. I'll finish with a couple of more factors of concentration and steadiness of mind um, that you may have observed me going through. Getting a sense of basic all rightness in the present so that you're not agitated, you're not contracted in fear, you're not stressed, you're not carried away by anger. There's nothing wrong with feeling stressed or anxious or carried away by anger. And there are times when it's appropriate to feel that way. Like, you know, the lion is chasing you across the Serengeti Plains. Of course you should feel that way. Of course in the moment you should, you know, it's appropriate to feel morally appalled at you know, un injustice, landing on yourself or landing on others. Okay. And for the purposes in meditation of stabilizing the mind, steadying it and quieting it, it can really help to find a sense inside yourself in the present of basic all rightness. In the present, there's enough air to breathe. In the present, the heart is still beating. The present, it could be far from perfect and there can be a reassuring, relieving <sighs> sense of basic okayness. If you can't get in touch with it, that's okay. It's okay. And that sense of basic all rightness, so that the war in the moment at least is over. In the moment at least, you're not resisting anything or fleeing from anything or pounding on anything. In the moment, if that's how you feel, you can probably observe that that supports a stability of, of presence of awareness. Another factor is open-heartedness, warm-heartedness. Uh, as we feel warm-hearted, as we kind of warm up the circuits of the heart, it helps us land and be present. We're, we're less agitated in our relationships. We're less preoccupied by issues with others. We're fed and nourished and buoyed and stabilized by warm-heartedness flowing through. That helps us to settle. We're scared furry animals and to feel connection, a, a, a caringness, a lovingness flowing out and flowing in can help to steady the mind. Numerous people, including major teachers, uh, will just routinely say, yeah, when I, when I meditate, they say, um, I start out with a few minutes of compassion and loving kindness practice, could be a few dozen minutes, and then maybe after you know, kind of dropping into that warm heartedness and lovingness, then um, they say, I might move into some a more kind of 
austere and specific and focused uh, concentration practice. And then by the end of the meditation, and then I'll get to this myself, they move into more of an open awareness where they just kind of relax doing, uh, whether it's the cultivation of love or the doing of really staying with uh, their object of attention, and they move more into an openness. I mean, that's a natural progression. And you can see, therefore, and these are people who are very, very, very experienced meditators, that the warm-heartedness is a factor of, of, of meditation that is fulfilling and meaningful and nourishing for them. Then last, the sense of contentment. That too, you know, to watch the subtleties of grasping or drivenness or fantasizing about future rewards in your mind, all of which take you away from the present, all of which disrupt steadiness of mind, especially as you want to move into, um, you know, more, you know, just deep states of st presence and stability in your meditation that can even start moving in the direction of the jhanas or other, you know, very luscious and deep and rich meditative experiences. If we're chasing something in the future out of a sense of something missing and discontent, well, if we're chasing something in the future, it's really hard to be just completely plopped into the present steadily. So that's why I offer those. And as with anything I offer, see for yourself. For me, you know, it's kind of like ticking the boxes or getting, you know, getting the aroma in the or or getting that quality in the background mood of um, you know, uprightness and dignity and deliberateness, the background mood of, um, you know, letting go of anxiety, of, of a calming, a tranquility, a quieting, spreading, getting a background sense of warm heartedness and heartfeltness, not just a kind of dry, you know, cerebral kind of meditating or willful meditating, a, a warm heartedness, a sweetness, you know, in the mood and also a sense of contentment sense of being content with what is in the moment already. Those qualities in the background mood, uh, the atmosphere of consciousness, I find, and it makes sense to me neurobiologically, really support steadiness of mind, even moving into deep, deep, deep concentration. Okay, so That's a why and a how for the second. Did I not mention Lee Brasington? I should have. So <laughs> definitely Lee Brasington as a teacher of the jhanas. All right. Okay. So third major why that overlaps, the second one, is to cultivate particular qualities in addition to steadiness of mind. To use meditation to cultivate um, compassion, uh, to cultivate worth. You know, if it's helpful for you when your mind is quiet while meditating to review maybe an issue with someone for a few minutes to shift, you know, mark the shift so you're not just, your mind's not just wandering aimlessly, but to mark the shift in a meditative space to kind of you know, reflect on a situation and, and land in a place that, that feels good for you and true, that supports your sense of, of worth and you know, a kind of an, a sense of your own goodness, your own good intentions. If if that's one of the fruits of that meditation for the few minutes that you did it, I don't see anything wrong with that. Meditation is a means to an end. And in the Buddhist frame, that end, among others in particular, though, is the end of suffering and the end of resting in increasingly stably um, a quality of of you know, morality and goodness and um, steadiness of presence uh, that's deeply, deeply wise, uh, full of happiness and love and inner peace. You know? So there's a place. So third, people use meditation to cultivate various qualities, compassion, kindness, equanimity, um, to cultivate, uh, let's say, tranquility, uh, to cultivate mindfulness, um, you know, we can use meditation in that way. 
And uh, there's a traditional saying that your mind takes its shape from what it rests upon. Uh, so as we rest our mind upon what draws our heart in meditation, which is a very intensive opportunity for learning in the broadest sense, we can cultivate those qualities. So you might ask yourself here, um, what would you like to cultivate more of? And maybe it would be helpful for you to take the feeling of that in the present as an object of attention sometimes. Maybe you'd like to cultivate a greater sense of openness and ease and confidence. Well, what would it be like to focus on that as you're sitting there, wherever you are, or however you do meditation, to dwell in what you would like to dwell in you? In other words, to borrow the Tibetan saying, to take the fruit as your path. What is it that you would like to grow? That's the fruit, let's say. And then as you rest your attention on that as a kind of path, you will be growing it within you through very natural, neurologically uh, situated processes of development and healing and change. So that's a third major why. And to be successful in that why, um, it really is helpful to start to have experiences of whatever it is you'd like to cultivate and then take in the good. Deliberately slow it down to feel like whatever that's being cultivated is sinking into you. It's really landing in you. And you're giving yourself over to it so that increasingly you're able to be that way wherever you go. Okay? Now, a fourth major why that's a particular example of something to cultivate which is liberating insight. Uh, the Pali term for this is vipassana. It's the heightening of insight. It's the development of insight into the impermanence of all experiences, into insight into their compoundedness, their deconstructability. My water bottle nearly tipped over as the cap was loose there. Mm. And also uh, the sense that all experiences arise and pass away um, interdependently, uh, connected with a vast web of causes, only a few of which are specifically related to you, so that more and more through insight, there can be a lightening up about our own streaming of consciousness and uh, less taking it personally. Uh, there can be insight into what creates suffering and what doesn't. You know, insight into patterns of craving, including increasingly subtle patterns of craving that create trouble for you and others. Uh, insight into the mind brain's tendency to thingify things rather than recognizing their foamy emptiness, their insubstantiality to make them brick like and positional and brr, brr, brr. you know, insight, uh, even liberating insight. Uh, you know, I was listening to a dialogue between Henry Shuckman and Stephen Batchelor. Um, you can see it on a YouTube, in YouTube. It's just an incredible conversation for about 45 minutes or so between the two of them. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous from some years ago. And at one point, Stephen Batchelor described the Buddha's enlightenment or described um, awakening, in, including the awakenings that are available to us in the present ourselves in two ways. He pointed out like these two qualities that just, wow, let me write up. Um, way of understanding the Buddha's enlightenment as he talked about it, and a way of understanding um, enlightenment as it's available to us continuously when we are in touch with these two things, which I'm about to state. First, a recognition of how everything is contingent, as Stephen put it. In other words, everything occurs interdependently and in some sense, ownerlessly. It's happening. It's happening in a foamy, disappearing, arising kind of way. It's continually falling apart and continually renewed. 
as process. Reality is this way. And our mental reality, our stream of consciousness, is of this, has this character. We might know this abstractly or conceptually, but to, but to be absolutely blown away with deep conviction of the truth of it first, okay? It's all foamy, it's all insubstantial, it's ownerless, it's occurring, it's contingent. It's everything falling apart and, con and arising continuously. And it's okay. It's okay. Craving can release. There could be pain, there could be sorrow, there could be joy, there could be pleasure. It's okay. There's not a problem. There might be things to do. There might be harms to avoid, but there doesn't have to feel like a problem about it. There doesn't need to be pressure, contraction, subtleties of craving. There doesn't need to be clouding in the mind of all our negative reactivities. These two things, essentially, you know, um, no self, no problem. <laughs> You know, foamy, insubstantial, cloud-like, and okayness, 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 the two together. And you can see the characteristic, the structural characteristic of suffering with this insight. I'm talking here about the fourth why to meditate, cultivation of insight. You can see that when you're suffering, both of these are present. There's a sense of things as solid, fixed entities, brick-like, they're thingified, and they're with a strong sense of self in that, in all that, or reacting to all that. And second, it's not good, <laughs> it's bad. Something's missing, something's wrong, it's a problem. There's, there's the basis for, you know, uh, fighting, fleeing, and freezing. Problematic. On the other hand, as the sense grows in us of, oh, the intertwiningness of everything, the allness of everything, uh, the emptiness of everything, and a fundamental disengagement from discontent and fearful contraction or angry aggression, or the social emotions of envy or shame, as those gradually we disengage from, then we suffer less and we cause less suffering for other people. So those two can be a major field of practice to develop in the sense of the interconnectedness of everything and the impermanence of things, the ongoingness emptily of everything, certainly our own streaming of consciousness, with a growing sense of in the core of your being, an unconditional sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love, even as you engage the world in active ways as great teachers and beings, um, whether it was the Buddha a long time ago or people like the Dalai Lama today. Okay, There's, that's a path right there. That's a path that's, that's quite real and authentic to develop. So that's the fourth major why, I think, people talk about why do they meditate, um, to develop insight, both into the nature and structures and fundamental universal processes of consciousness and into broader uh, relationships be between cause and effect that lead to more or less suffering, more or less, more or less happiness, more or less welfare for yourself and others. And then there's the fifth kind of major purpose that I see, and there may well be others, and I'm just using my way of describing it. You might map what I'm saying to other maps here. Um, and um, this purpose in terms is, is also a kind of cultivation. It's to increasingly rest in true nature, the ground state, you know, what's, who are you when you are not doing anything in your mind? What's there 
when there's not even a sense that it's my mind. There's just awareness and phenomena changing in awareness. What's going on there? And um, I want to see if I can do something here kind of quickly and see if I can get a quotation for you. Coming. Here we go. Great. Ah, okay. So I'm not able to get you the quotation, and that's okay. So here's where people talk about practices of open awareness or calm abiding. You're just abiding. Or Diana Winston, wonderful teacher, talks about natural awareness. Um, you're, you're just, you know, you're just abiding as awareness. Uh, what can foster this is to uh, have a sense of spaciousness. Uh, often we uh, develop steadiness of mind and then we start moving into more choiceless awareness or open awareness because we've, we're steady, we're stable, we're present. We can do open awareness and not get lost in it. You know, there can be a sense, especially for major doers like me, of letting go of doing in your mind, you know, releasing those little moves we make if we're experienced meditators, and more and more just letting it fall away, fall away, fall away. And as the mind gets quieter and just kind of rested increasingly in, in the natural state, you know, before any contraction, before any doing, da -da, there can be the sense that this natural state is extending into, into everything and is transpersonal in some sense. That there's a sense of a kind of witnessing or knowing that can feel beyond you. Now, what this means, people have been arguing about for a long time. I'm not going to get into the argument. I'm just describing it as a as phenomena, as a kind of experience, as as a sense of it. There's just presence, and um, some people teach that the path should start here, that we should begin with this sense, or just drop into it as best we can. If we're able to do that, great. Most people are not. Uh, the other whys to meditate that I've covered, the first four, um, do tend to really cultivate factors, causes and conditions that enable a stability of this fifth why to practice. And if you're if you're here, you know, if you've had some background with the first four whys, um, you know, it may be that for you and your practice, it would be really helpful, as it's been for me, to increasingly, you know, explore this, this fifth why. And the how of it, as I've said, you know, a lot is just simply about letting go. You know, no, Ajahn Chah talked about this kind of deep practice as knowing in the sense of uh, there are experiences occurring, uh, which does not presume a knower. There can be knowing without a thingified knower, there is there is awareness, there is knowing what with letting go, aware and letting go, aware and letting go, aware and letting go. And this can get pretty subtle and very interesting and remarkable. And, and as there can be potentially a sense of your own small b being, small b being, somehow partaking of some kind of capital B being. And I would add as a how my last point here for this fifth why of practice or aim of practice, um, it can be 
really quite helpful to explore, um, which might start conceptually, you don't feel it yet, but you can start to feel it maybe, or maybe you're natural at it already. Uh, I'm working at it. Um, to explore a sense, you know, as you're just resting, you're just being, that in the being inherently, in the ongoing arising of what's occurring, in, in the fertile givingness of the ar continual arisings of the universe, there is a kind of love. Maybe that word, you know, relate to it. I'm not trying to posit some sort of universal love, cosmic love, although maybe, but it's more like there's just a sense somehow that touches your heart as you're being spaciously, edgelessly, therefore boundlessly, this kind of being that in it can feel like, wow, there is such a fertile, fertile givingness, such an arising givingness that you are part of a stream of. And that can help you kind of rest in that form of being. Anyway, that's something I've been exploring. Okay, a lot of ground to cover. I know I'm approaching the end here, and I appreciate the 381 people who've been hanging in here with this all. Uh, and... Um, just want to see maybe, I know we're going to talk about this next time. I didn't want to freak you out, but I thought, you know, why do we meditate and how to meditate and to mark a whole range of possibilities. And also in a sense to push back a bit myself on those who would say there's just one right way to meditate. No, the Buddha, just to take Buddhism, which is just one stream of the wisdom traditions around the world, the contemplative traditions, which certainly include those of the first people, the native indigenous people. They have, you know, contemplative traditions, obviously great, rich, deep contemplative traditions, uh, as well as, you know, others in the world. Um, even in the Buddhist tradition, there's a lot of meditative types of meditation. There are a lot of whys to meditate. So it's, it's okay. But I thought it was useful for me, at least. It's been useful to mark the different whys, to know why I'm doing something, what's the point of a particular practice, or to know that there, if there is an aim, a point, that certain hows are skillful means in the service of that particular aim. I certainly haven't been exhaustive here in my 40 or so minutes. Uh, it's a lot of ground to cover. And I think what I'll do is really set aside next week to talk about this in terms of questions that you might have. Uh, let me just double check that I'm going to be here next week. I think I am. Um, yes, I am definitely going to be here next week. It's good to know. Um, okay, so let me just see if there's any key question or comment that's come up. Okay, good. I'm seeing the questions. Hopefully this is working through. Uh, it's okay that um, uh, you didn't, if, if you didn't relate to some of the things I'm talking about, that's okay. That's okay. It's kind of like a coach who says, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about basketball. I'm a terrible basketball player. You watch somebody dribbling between their legs like, what? <laughs> I can't do that. I don't even understand that. Why would you do that? I you're like, that was weird. I don't get it. Um, it's okay. You know, then you start to realize, oh, maybe you start to be able to get a taste of that. And then more and more it becomes a part of you. That's all right. It's a progressive path. And certainly in the Buddhist tradition, it's aimed at full awakening. You know, why set our sights short as long as the path keeps making sense and we're not stressing out? You know, we're, we're finding that middle way. The Buddha talked about, you know, neither too tight nor too loose a string in the lute or in Zen, neither too loose or tight a, a, the rein of the horse. We find that middle way where we keep, you know, on going. We keep, we keep on going while also not getting uptight about it, right? So I'm, hopefully that was okay. And I want to speak briefly to Brenda Dixon Gottschild's question comment at 721. Then we'll finish formally. Those of you that are still want to be here can be sorted into breakout rooms. 
uh, on Zoom by my co-pilot, Tom Brown. Tom, why don't you raise your hand so you go to the front of the queue, and then I'll make you a co-host here. Um, Elaine, let's let's definitely raise that hand next week, okay? We'll get into questions here. Point I wanted to make about what Brenda brought up is 721. Um, how can you possibly feel, let's say, disengaged or less caught up in, in anxiety if you or family members or those you care about are actively threatened? Often you can't. In the moment, you can't. And so I'm not, you shouldn't even try. It's not appropriate in that moment. Maybe when you get a little breathing room, you know, when you're driving home or you get a little breathing room just before bed, for a minute or so, you can get a little space between you and what's happening. And in that space, you can explore in whatever way is authentic and seems appropriate and accessible to you, something meditative that would be supportive, including helping you be strong on behalf of these other people. So point one. Point two, it can also be true that as we develop traits inside ourselves of resilience, of inner calm, of fortitude, of grit, of a kind of unconditional goodwill, good wishes for others, as you know, we naturally develop these as traits within us, they persist in the core of our being, even as the outermost parts of us are just enraged or panicky or alarmed on behalf of ourselves or other people. So, you know, that, that, that can happen. And um, in the moment that we're swept away, we're not able to rest in true nature, certainly. But with practice and with time, there can even be a sense of that true nature, the deepest level uh, of, our, of our being, that's accessible to us, even you know, in the worst times, the scariest times of our life. And people report that, I've experienced that. It's, we don't rest in true nature as a spiritual bypass to avoid dealing with or being authentic about how we really feel, understandably. It's just that we grow in our access to a kind of, in a sense, unconditioned, um, you know, um, unconditional, resilient core way deep down inside, no matter what's happening around us. And that's, a, to me, a realistic and authentic possibility that doesn't deny at all the crappiness, you know, that can really happen in this world. Okay, so how about we just sort of sit together for a minute or so, covered a lot of ground. And to be clear as well, I spoke of formal meditation. We can be meditative. We can be meditative, if not formally meditating. We can be meditative first to relax and disengage from some of the stressful busyness. We can be meditative to stabilize and steady the mind. We can be meditative or meditate to cultivate particular qualities that are, po that are positive and skillful and helpful for ourselves and other people can be meditative or meditate to sharpen our insight. Whether it's understanding ourselves better and what makes us reactive and how to be less reactive or even understanding the nature of consciousness, the nature of, the of all experiences, deepening in insight. And we can be meditative, we can meditate to come home, to dwell in our underlying home, the ground state, when we're not disturbed, not agitated, not divided internally, not contracted, not at war, <sighs> being, being, opening out into everything. Perhaps along the way with some kind of mysterious light shining through. These are different purposes in meditation.